The Internet is not the answer, hieß es in seinem frühen Bestseller. Und äh, jetzt ist ein neues Buch erschienen. So sieht es aus. How to fix the future. Äh, fünf Reparaturvorschläge für eine menschlichere, digitale Welt. Meine Damen und Herren, wie wir das alles hinkriegen können, das weiß er. Und das wird er uns jetzt vielleicht mitteilen, zumindest in Auszügen. Das ganze Buch schaffen wir heute nicht, aber zumindest mal so die prägnanten Key Facts. Meine Damen und Herren, hier ist Andrew Keen. Herzlich willkommen. I didn't, I didn't understand any of that, so uh, I'm speaking in darkness, literally as well. I don't see many of you. Uh, I can tell you, though, I, I, I think I understand what that video thing was. We're going to have a timer, right? Because I know I've got 20 minutes. So, uh, so when we get the timer on, I can start. Um, I can tell you what blockchain is, according to probably the world's leading expert on blockchain. Uh, Canadian uh, futurist called Don Tapscott, who's a friend or a friendly enemy, as we say in, uh, in America and Canada. Uh, he says blockchain is the new internet, um, which means it has all the promise and all the danger of, uh, of the original internet. And you will hear all the same garbage about democracy, and opportunity and transparency, all the same garbage about flattening the world, of doing away with keynote speakers like me and media executives like yourself, all the same garbage about replacing the establishment with the people. And I guarantee you about, I, I can tell you one thing about blockchain. By the way, we got the timer on. Where is it? I don't see it. Can we put the timer on? Because otherwise I'll talk. Okay, I will, I, will, um, I will just check it with my, with my cell phone and I will just say immediately stop. When have a word with blockchain. Um, have a word with the internet. Uh, so, blockchain is the future, or one of the futures. I heard about AI in terms of the introduction. Of course, uh, the internet of things, uh, virtual reality, augmented reality. Uh, the future is incredibly exciting on the one hand, but of course very daunting and worrying on the other. I've always been a builder, if you like, of the future. The other two things I heard at the beginning of this in terms of describing me, I was described as a Silicon Valley insider, which originally is a kind of contradiction in terms, because there weren't supposed to be any Silicon Valley insiders in the mid-90s when a group of kind of eccentric, eclectic failures like myself happened to be in San Francisco when it became clear in the early 90s that the internet was the new, new thing, the big new thing. Um, the notion of insiders was supposed to be of done away with, with the digital revolution. We were supposed to be democratizing everything, doing away with platforms, doing away with keynote speakers, doing away with media executives like yourselves. Everything was supposed to be um, distributed. Everything was supposed to be on the edge. So the notion of an establishment uh, was supposed to be done away with. Uh, for Europeans and particularly for Germans, classic revolutionary rhetoric, which of course turns out to be anything but true, because of course today we know that more than anything else there is a Silicon Valley establishment. Unfortunately, I'm not part of it. Uh, but uh, an establishment which is in many ways ruling the world, or certainly wealthier than, than everybody else in the world. The other thing I heard uh, in terms of the introduction was level playing field. That is the, the key sort of ideology of the original digital revolution of entrepreneurs like myself, of activists. Everything was supposed to be flattened. Everything was supposed to be equalized. So. Since the 90s, though, of course, we've seen the narrative unfold. We've seen the story of Silicon Valley manifest itself. So we've gone from theory to practice. We've gone from hope to actuality. And what has happened? Over the last 30 years, we've seen, as we all know, the appearance of a new kind of establishment. We were promised, Peter Thiel famously said, uh, we were promised 
flying cars with all this new technology and all we got were, was Twitter and 140 characters. His critique was we didn't get enough technology. My critique in some ways is that the promise wasn't realized. It was more than just promising flying cars, although uh, flying cars of course would be nice as long as they don't crash into one another. We were promised more jobs. We were promised the redistribution of wealth. We were promised new kinds of business models, better business models. And above all else, we were promised uh, cultural enlightenment. We were promised more understanding, more talking, more communication, more conversation. We were promised that everyone would have a voice, that everyone would have a platform to express themselves. We were promised that the world would become more intimate and understanding. So on many levels, the revolution, the digital revolution, which is changing every industry, it changed your industry first, the media industry, but it's changing transportation and banking and finance. It's changing hospitality. It's changing government. It's changing every industry in the world and indeed all society. It was supposed to dramatically improve the world. It was supposed to create a level playing field, better business models, more jobs, more economic equality and opportunity. Above all else, as I said, better cultural understanding. We still haven't got our timer on, you know? Really, really harshly interrupt you. Okay. Well, I'll just go on forever. Uh, no, 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 no. I'm, I'm just, I'm here, I'm watching the timer. Okay. Everything's how much, fine. How, many, how much have I done so far? Um, I guess... Three minutes. Uh, you have 10 to go, 10, ten to, to go. go. If you drink a sip of water, you have nine to go. Yeah. <laughs> and if I spit the drink of water out, uh, you have, back uh, up to 10. Then you're just um, uh, ready to go. Yeah. Okay, so what do we have? We spent the first 10 minutes laying out the promise. The reality, of course, is something quite different. The reality is something I've described in my first three books. This, How to Fix the Future, is my fourth book. In Cult of the Amateur, I described the way in which our cultural economy and culture has been wrecked by platforms, supposedly democratizing platforms that enable corruption, do away with expertise, undermine truth. I wrote that back in 2007. Even I didn't imagine Trump or fake news or Putin. But it was really the inevitable outcome of doing away with gatekeepers, doing away with rules, allowing everyone to have a voice and trusting that they would use those voices responsibly and honestly. Because after all, as uh, some famous American once said, we're not angels. And if we were, we wouldn't need government. And if we were, we wouldn't need gatekeepers or media. In my second book, Digital Vertigo, I lay out the way in which social media is anything but so social. It actually is a kind of mirror refle which reflects us, that encourages a kind of narcissism. Obama was once described as the first internet president. That was entirely wrong. Trump is the first internet president because he's an extreme narcissist, because he views the world in acutely uh, subjective terms and sees everything as a mirror on himself. The medium and the architect of the medium, Trump and Twitter, naturally go together. Then in my third book, uh, the internet is not the answer, I explain that this economy is a winner-take-all economy. An economy in which, rather than there being many victors, you have a tiny handful, one usually, one company dominant in each sector. Facebook in social media, Google in search, Amazon in e-commerce. Doesn't make these companies bad, it's just a law of digital. It's the network effect, the way in which this digital economy is working out. So it isn't creating a level playing field, it's actually creating something quite the reverse. It's creating a situation in which monopolies are natural and almost inevitable. In the internet's not the answer, I also argue that the business model of many of the dominant Silicon Valley companies are themselves uh, deeply flawed because by giving out their products for free, whether it's Facebook or Google or Twitter or Instagram, they're turning the user into the product. They're destroying privacy, the essential ingredient of democracy, of individualism, of freedom of the modern age. So, where are we? Uh, over the last 10 years, since I, as originally, uh, I suppose, a Silicon Valley insider, or more relevantly, a Silicon Valley believer, began to realize the truth, the monstrous truth of what we were creating, 
more and more people have begun to agree with me. In 2007, I was accused of being an elitist, out of touch, not understanding technology. Now everyone is articulating the same message. We all agree that the future is broken. The future that we cherish, that we believed in. The future of the level playing field. The future of equality and democracy and opportunity. Ten, nine, eight, eight seven. Sounds like no, no, an, take your time. He, he sounds like, he sounds like a, an AI machine. You see, we... I am. I'm German. <laughs> you said it, not me. <laughs> There's just one thing that, we, that we're that's good the Ger- at, and that's it's being Germans, on time. That's why the Germans are going to win in AI. By the way, one of my jokes, one of my German jokes in there, I, I talked to uh, Paul Callan, the CEO of uh, Birder, for, my, um, uh, for the paperback version of the book, and I have him in the introduction, and he's a keen uh, a football uh, fan, and he said to me that, uh, I said, where are we in the unfolding the the story of the internet and he said we're at the 60th minute in other words in a soccer game that's when the germans and i know this as an englishman when the germans start to win so uh <laughs> maybe talking about eight and nine we could talk about 60 minutes uh yeah you've got five more minutes okay uh, no more german jokes please <laughs> you started it <laughs> no more german jokes okay So how to fix the future? How do we fix this stuff? I think everyone is agreed. We all know fake news. We know narcissistic presidents. We know the shift towards authoritarianism as a consequence of social media. We know the rise of these trillion dollar companies. Above all else, in terms of AI, we know the looming threat on employment because we've created technology that replicates us that actually couldn't do your job, maybe not mine, but can probably do most of yours. AI, which is not only replace, potentially replacing drivers, but um, doctors and lawyers and engineers. AI that is so smart, that is so expert, that it means that we can't compete with it. We certainly can't beat it in chess or Go. And increasingly, we won't be able to beat it in most other areas. So what are we going to do? How are we going to fix the future? Because the future is broken. The future is daunting, it's challenging, it's scary. Most of us feel really quite weak. We feel as if there's this huge forces that we can't control, and that's the first challenge. What I argue in the book is that the meta narrative, the way in which we fix the future, is by seizing back agency, human agency, which is essential in the 21st century. Human agency, which is the key issue. Because after all, this new technology, this AI technology, potentially undermines agency. Some people, like Bill Gates, even believe that it will have agency. The future, though, I think, if we're going to be historical, has always been broken. And we need to look back into the past. I look back to Thomas More's utopia. I look back to the Industrial Revolution and the Renaissance and show that the future has always been broken and we've always fixed it because we've always displayed agency. We've always manifested our power over our inventions. We've always made sure that the technology that we create, we master rather than it masters us. So that's the key message in how to fix the future agency. It's a philosophical idea, which, of course, I think many Germans will be very comfortable with. So how more specifically do we do that? I look at five areas where we can manifest agency, where we can deal with these issues, where we can begin to level the playing field again. I went to talk to Margrethe Vestager, one of my heroes, the uh, former Danish uh, vice uh, pres- uh, prime minister who is now runs the antitrust uh, division at the, uh, at the EU. She said to me that her job was leveling the playing field. And that's the only way historically, when you have monopolies, when you have trillion dollar companies, that the the playing field ever gets leveled through regulation. Now, that doesn't mean that I rely exclusively on regulation. My strategies for fixing the future are fivefold, but regulation is essential. Silicon Valley has essentially been unregulated over the last 30 or 40 years, which is why we have these monopolies now. I do weird stuff on the, on the stage to get your attention because the five minutes are over. Yeah. Huh? Yeah. The five minutes are over. I just do stuff to get your attention. Oh. Yeah. Yeah. Two more minutes. Walking around. 
So we need regulation. We need laws about privacy. We need antitrust regulation. We need to treat companies like Facebook and Google as traditional media companies. But we also need innovation. We need, and I have it in my book, examples of German entrepreneurs creating new products that reflect the interests of consumers, that don't treat them as products, that respect their privacy. We need consumers to articulate their interests more aggressively, as they've done throughout history, as I show, as I show from the car industry to the food industry to many other industries. Consumers need to be more aggressive. They need to be more demanding and they need to be more honest. A free product is never free. They need to understand that. When something is free, they're the ones who end up paying. We need citizen engagement, whether it's people like Mark Benioff in Silicon Valley, whether it's lawyers protecting the rights of Uber drivers, whether it's parents or teachers. We need everyone to shape the future. Agency is a democratic idea. It doesn't just come from Margaret Vestager. It doesn't just come from heads of media companies or from multi-billionaires like Mark Benioff. And finally, we need a new kind of education system. My final chapter is on education. It goes back, interestingly, to a German ideal, the Waldorf ideas of, 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 uh, of Steiner, of Rudolf Steiner, who came up with his ideas after the First World War of reintroducing a humanism into education. This was pre-digital. This was before the invention of the World Wide Web. This goes back to agency. We are on the cusp of perhaps the biggest revolution technologically in the last millennia, the AI revolution, which potentially, some people say, is our last invention, which potentially replaces us. We need to figure out our place in this new world. We can't compete with the algorithm. But it's in education systems like Waldorf, which focuses on creativity and empathy, the very strengths, the very human qualities that the algorithm can't rep reproduce, that we need to stake our claim to manifest our agency. So regulation, innovation, consumer power, uh, citizen engagement and education, those are the five strategies, but above all else, it's agency. We can make the world a better place. We can turn the world, perhaps, into the utopian vision that Silicon Valley originally envisaged, but it's going to get time. There's no app to fix the future. Whatever Don Tapscott tells you, it's not going to be blockchain. It's not new technology. It's humans, people like us. We can fix the future, so it's time to do it. Thank you. Would you be so kind and sign that for me?